nice to meet you all here today. My name is John Kinnear. I'm an architect, an architectural historian. We've been working on the Scots who built New York now for a number of years, and we have uh, covered Manhattan quite extensively from the time of New Amsterdam to the present day. We're now going to be taking a look at all the different boroughs around the city. Starting with Brooklyn, the Brooklyn Navy Yard. This has been in existence pre-Civil War, and, it, and it's been a Navy base for building new ships, repairing ships. The Navy Yard was very important during World War II and World War I, and has a number of buildings that were very in, influenced by or constructed by Sc people of Scottish descendants. The Brooklyn Navy Yard Commandant's House. This was designed by John McComb, Jr. His family was in the United States from the early 1700s. He and his father were major architect builders prior to this Revolutionary War and then very, much, very active after the Revolutionary War. This house was built in 1805, and it's a, it's a good example of um, federal architecture. Next, we're going to take a look at the Brooklyn Navy Yard Hospital, which was done by Martin T. Thompson. We'll be seeing more of him throughout the different boroughs. He was quite active, again, during the uh, 18th, the 19th century. This building represents a simplified version of the Greek Revival style, which was very much in fashion during this period, the 1830s, all done in limestone, the entire building. The monument for the soldiers of the Revolutionary War who were prisoners in the harbor, where the Brooklyn Navy Yard now is, he um, made a monument done by McKim Mead and White for all those soldiers that were imprisoned on ships. This is in uh, Fort Greene, which is Cl the Clinton part of Brooklyn. This photograph shows what one of these ships were like. Most people that were imprisoned on these ships did not survive. This is now the uh, concession where you can uh, you get more information by souvenirs when you're there. Again, it was a McKim Mead and White building, just beautiful. The eagles that used to be in front of the park are now in the parks department, and one of them is located at the arsenal in Central Park by the zoo. The 88th police precinct, done by Thomas O'Brien and George Ingram. This is the police precinct for the Fort Greene area and also the area around Pratt Institute. The Emanuel Baptist Church, Francis Kimball architect, built in 1887 and paid for by Charles Pratt, who also started and paid for Pratt Institute. The photograph here is the main building at Pratt Institute. This is the school that I learned how to become an architect. The library by William Tubby was the first free library in Brooklyn. This is the Higgins School of Architecture, where I had many of my classes. It was later added on to by Stephen Hull, who was a, also an alum of Pratt. William Tubby also did the uh, South Hall, which was where most of the school of restaurants, cooking, etc., took place. The President's House, Bab, Cook, and Wilcox were the architects for this building, and it inspired Andrew Carnegie to hire them to be the architects for his home on 90th Street, Fifth Avenue. St. Mary's Church, Richard Ugamati. This is a church that's still in the neighborhood. Now we move down to Grand Army Plaza. John Duncan was the architect for the for the arch, and it was also helped by McKim Mead and White. This this arch was built to commemorate all the Union soldiers that took part in the Civil War. The arch was finished before the statues were completed. Frederick McMonies and Philip Martini did the did the statues, huge bronze statues. Uh, John Duncan was also the architect. For Grant's tomb, which is an absolutely wonderful building. If you haven't been there, you should go. The Brooklyn Museum by McKim Mead and White. At the time it was built, it was the largest museum in the world. It's adjacent to Prospect Park and the Botanical Gardens. There are 30 heroic statues that adorn the facade of the building. At the rear of the building is the Sculpture Garden by Frieda Schiff Warburg. The garden contains many of the statues that used to be at Penn Station, which was, of course, Charles McKim's primary contribution to New York City. 
There's an interior of the station at the time. And this is the interior of the museum. Moving further south in Brooklyn, we come to Coney Island. The cyclone was invented by Charles Baker. Uh, it's probably one of the grandest structures in Brooklyn, and it's still in existence and still used. We now come to the Sunset Park Center by Henry Magoon, built in 1934. It was one of 11 large public swimming pools built in New York City uh, by Robert Moses to help out during the Depression. Seaside Park in Coney Island was Denison Heron's, 1923. It was originally a child's restaurant and then became a roller rink. Sears and Roebuck department store. Nimmin Carr and Wright in Beverly Road, 1932. It's an Art Deco masterpiece. And Eleanor, Eleanor Roosevelt attended the opening and bought a pair of baby shoes. And we had the Russian Orthodox Cathedral, Nicholson Galloway, Byzantine style. 1921, and this building is in Williamsburg. The Friends Meeting House, Charles Bunting, 1857, on Skimmerhorn Street, downtown Brooklyn. Very, very simplified, but beautiful Georgian style building. Greenwood Cemetery, McGovern Weir Greenhouse. This was by Curtis Gillespie. It's the last commercial greenhouse in the city, and it serves Greenwood Cemetery, which it's adjacent to. The cemetery is an incredible place. The chapel was built in 1911 by Warren and Wetmore. They were the architects for Grand Central Station. There's a plan of the, of the Greenwood Cemetery. There's over 600,000 graves in this. And it was considered, though, to be the first park in, in Brooklyn. And it was laid out by the architect David Bates Douglas in 1838. The Red-Legged Devils, 14th Regiment Armory, William Mundell, 1891. Park Slope. The, all the armories we're going to be seeing have been repurposed. It's really good instead of having them getting not, you know, destroyed. This one is now a woman's shelter. They all basically had this uh, castle style. The 23rd Regiment, 1891, Fuller and Hughes. Brooklyn had a total of eight armories. This one's now a homeless shelter. The Dime Savings Bank, Tracy and Walker in 1906. Landmarked in 1994, wonderful structure. And it is now the entrance to uh, the tallest building in Brooklyn. They call it Brooklyn Tower, done by shop architects. And these photographs show how they've repurposed the main banking hall as the grand entry to this tower. It's a combination of offices and apartments. The Henry and Susan McDonald House, McDonald was a baker. He lived near the Brooklyn Navy Yard, actually commuted back to Manhattan in the day. His house was built in 1853. State Street Townhouses, a good example of early townhouse construction with details from the Greek Revival period, 1847. The Brooklyn Railroad Company, they had electric engines and they would transport people to, the, uh, to where they could get ferry boats to Manhattan. And this is their headquarter building, which was in done by David Morton in 1860. It's now Loft Apartments, again, repurposed. Prospect Park, one of the gems of Brooklyn, of course. There's the administration building, a wonderful dome, 40 Division Avenue. And here's Litchfield Villa, Italianate style by Andrew Jackson Davis. He was a prominent architect in this period. And this was a private home, but it became park property in 1868 and is still there. You can visit it. This is one of the main buildings at the park. It was done, it's the entrance to the Botanical Gardens, and it was by McKim Made in White. McKim Made in White also did the Penner style. It's the wonderful gathering place uh, in the park. You can get out of the get out of the heat, get out of the rain. <laughs> Brooklyn had many, many of the Andrew Carnegie libraries. Andrew Carnegie would, would build the library with the understanding that the city would take over the, uh, the staffing of it, the maintenance, supply the books. And of all the libraries in New York, I think there's 67, uh, most of them are still used as libraries. Half of them were done by Scottish architects. 
Lord and Yule did this one in Bedford area of Brooklyn. Arlington Library, Richard Walker, classic revival style. Richard Walker also did number one Wall Street. Williamsburg Library, Richard Walker. And this was the first library by Carnegie in Brooklyn, still in service. Now we're gonna move on to Queens. If you recall, all of the boroughs around New York City, around Manhattan were independent cities until about the 1890s when the city consolidated. So all the boroughs have their own municipal buildings, which are still there, mostly repurposed for something else. This was the New York State Pavilion at the World's Fair in 1964. Philip Johnson was the architect. This building still is there and it's been renovated recently. The uh, Unisphere was designed by Gilmore Clark Landscape Architects. And, uh, and there, here's another picture of the interior. We now go to, to Kennedy Airport. This building was the TWA terminal. It was designed by Errol Saarinen, not a Scott, but Howard Hughes owned TWA at the time and commissioned Errol Saarinen to design this building. It's iconic. It's, it's a worldwide representation of incredible architecture. It's now the entryway to a hotel at JetBlue. JetBlue now has the terminal here. And it's a wonderful example of a repurposing. It's now restaurant space. It's now the way you can get to the hotel. And if you haven't visited, you really should. It's unbelievable. Here's Howard Hughes in his plane called the Spruce Goose, built in 1940, all out of wood. It's not, there's no real metal. And uh, Howard Hughes, as I said, he was the president or the owner of TWA. And this is a recreation of his office at Kennedy Airport. They actually have a constellation, which at the time the terminal was built, this was the premier airliner. They found this one in Maine in terrible condition, completely restored it, and took it by truck through Manhattan, through the middle of Times Square, and eventually got out to Kennedy Airport, where you can now visit its cocktail lounge now. Now we move on to the Ridgewood Theater. Thomas Lamb, a Scot who did many, many theaters in Manhattan and also in some of the other boroughs. This one was 1916, now been converted to apartments. RKO Keith Theater, again, Thomas Lamb. He did those incredibly uh, over-the-top interior theater settings. Louis Armstrong's house is in Corona, Queens. It's now a museum done by Robert Johnson in 1910, and another place that you can visit, it's open to the public. Queens County Courthouse, Alfred Hickles, 1936, described as a modern classical style. Ridgewood Savings Bank, Halsey, McCormick, and Helmer, 1939, modern classical and deco style, still in use. Jamaica Learning Center, William Tubby, we've seen him before at Pratt Institute. This was the Jamaica High School in the Dutch Revival style. And it's now been repurposed as a learning center. New York Architectural Terracotta Building. Francis Kimball, 1892. Terracotta was an incredibly used architectural material. It was cast. It created beautiful castings. Uh, as an example, the, uh, the, the plaque, that's all terracotta on the side of that tower. And this building is, was in operation for many, many years. The Allen Belleville House. Yeah, William Douglason owned the house, and Douglas in Queens was named after him. He also owned America's Cup winning yacht, uh, which won in 1871. Chapeau was the name. Jamaica Arts and Learning, originally a Queens office of the registrar, Italian Renaissance style, 1898. Again, a reuse of an existing building. A.S. McGregor is the architect. Belmont Racetrack. August Belmont and William Collins built it in 1905. The racetrack is still going strong, part of the Triple Crown. Uh, also the site of early air shows. This one was in 1910. Moving up to the Bronx. Bronx has nine of the Carnegie libraries. Eight of them were done by Scottish architects. This is the Hunts Point branch. Carrier and Hastings built it in 1929. Here's the, the public library in Morrisania. This is by Bab, Cook, and Willard. They did the president's house. And then we have the uh, Fordham branch done by McKim, Mead, and White in 1923. Bartopel Mansion, constructed in 
1836 by Robert Bartow. Absolutely wonderful example of Greek revival and Georgian architecture combined. The house is now open to the public. Robert Moses created Pelham Bay Park. He knocked down many, many, many mansions that, that faced out onto the water. And this is the only one that he left standing. And it's owned by the city now, luckily. It has one of the largest collections of Duncan Fife furniture that you'll find anywhere. And it's been the home of the International Garden Club since 1914. The Grand Concourse is a major thoroughfare in, in the Bronx. And during the 1920s especially, many wonderful apartment buildings were built on both sides of it. This is an example of one of the apartment buildings by Kilby, Tim Cole, and Walker. The Bronx Zoo, the landscape architect was Harold A. Kepharn. The Bird Court, 1899, now Astor Court, was influenced by the 1893 Columbian Exhibition in Chicago, was known as the City Beautiful or the White City. Martin Euclid Thompson was involved in many of the early 19th century New York projects. The Botanical Gardens Conservatory, 1899, William Cobb, renovated totally in the last 20 years or so. It's a, it's a wonderful place to visit, of course, and it's where they have the famous Christmas show with the uh, model railroad that has models of many, many of the New York landmark buildings. The Bronx Firehouse, done 1902 by Alexander Stevens, still in existence. Fort Apache Police Precinct, made famous by the movie with Paul Newman. The Borough Courthouse, Michael Garvin, architect, built in 1905 in the Beaux-Arts style, still used. Corona Place Center, Herbert Magoon, 1936, another one of the city's large public swimming pools. The Bronx Grit Chamber, Lips Island. The chamber was used to, for water treatment, and it was done by McKim, Mead, and White in 1936. Knightsbridge Armory, Fletcher and Tatchell, 1917. Largest armory in the world in the Romanesque style. Um, it may become the international ice skating center. Uh, its future is not guaranteed yet, though. The Hall of Fame, the Kim Mead and White and the Gould Memorial Library, 1901. Helen Gould donated the funds for this. It's now the Bronx Community Center. Again, a must-see if you're up in the Bronx. The building is beautiful. And the arcade around the reach on the top of the retaining wall has statues of many famous people throughout American history. Edgar Allan Poe's house, a vernacular little farmhouse that he lived in for a while. They actually reproduced this house at the Ford Hotel Complex in Dearborn, Michigan. That's Henry Ford, the, the car manufacturer, and you can stay in it. <laughs> Font Hill, home of Edwin Forrest, attributed to Andrew Jackson Davis, and it's now part of the College of St. Mary. Beautiful Gothic little building. Davis started with Federal, then he went to Greek Revival style, and then he eventually got into Gothic style, and he got into a lot of uh, Romantic Revival styles. This is the uh, William Morris House, 1843. It's at the Wave Hill Gardens, uh, another must-see if you haven't been there. There was this mansion house still. It was two estates that were joined together, and the gardens, are, it's now open to the public. It's It really is worth seeing. It's right on the Hudson River. Woodlawn wow. Cemetery, founded in 1863. Uh, monuments by all the leading architects of the day are to be found here. You can take tours. They have tours to show you some of them. But Kim Mead and White, Carrie and Hastings, John Russell Pope, they're all there. Everyone's there. Yankee Stadium, the house that Ruth bit. Turner Construction did it and uh, redid it in 2009 and was founded by Henry Turner, who started his firm, still a massive, huge construction company, in 1902. He was a Scot. We're going to Staten Island now. <laughs> Snug Harbor is at Richmond Terrace. That's where you, when you take the ferry boat to Staten Island, you get off close to this. Martin Thompson, 1831 to 1833, in the Greek Revival style, it's a series of quite a few buildings. Many of them are now, fortunately, have been repurposed. Is the Cultural Center. Carnegie Corporation's given a lot of money recently to restore the building and put it to use. Staten Island has, I believe, the only Frank Lloyd Wright house in the city. 
It was the Crimson Beach House for the Cass family. It was uh, when Frank Lloyd Wright was exploring the idea of making houses that middle class people could afford. He called them un Unisonian houses. And this is an example, and it's still there in Staten Island. Still a private residence, but it's still there. Standard Varnish Works Factory Office Building. 1892, Colin McQueen, the American the Rounded Art Style. The buildings are still there, repurposed. It was a major, a major industrial complex on, in Staten Island, sending their varnish throughout the world. The, again, the Carnegie Libraries. This one's of Kirian Hastings. Now, Hastings actually lived on Staten Island, so you'll see that he got many commissions there. Stapleton Library, 1907, Carrier and Hastings. The modern part was added in 2013 by Andrew Baseman. Tottenville Library. Tottenville is at the very south tip of Staten Island. Carrier and Hastings, 1904. This is the first Carnegie Library in Staten Island. Court Richmond Library, Carrier and Hastings, 1905. All the libraries have been, as you can see from the in here, interior here, they've been redone, modernized somewhat to, to meet the needs of a modern library, but the buildings are intact and have held the, held the taste of test of time. The Henry Hogg Scott House, 1840. It's located in Conference House Park. Now, Conference House Park is an interesting place to visit if you're on Staten Island. There's a Dutch house next to this house that was the site of a conference between the leaders of the Revolutionary War and the British. The British had sent 30,000 troops, which were now all anchored off of Staten Island, and they did want to, they did not want to go to war with the colonists. So a conference was held to decide if there was any way the, the founders of the revolution would plead allegiance to the king so there would not be a battle. This did not happen, obviously, and the 30,000 troops did eventually go to Brooklyn, and that led to the Battle of Brooklyn, which was one of the first battles of the Revolution. George Washington was in charge and barely escaped to Manhattan. George Cunningham store, 1892, Carpenter Gothic style. The Staten Island Borough Hall, again, Carrier and Hastings, 1906, French Renaissance style. Building is, of course, repurposed and is being used to this day. Richmond County Courthouse, Carrier and Hastings, 1919, adjacent to Borough Hall. Roman-inspired Renaissance revival, Greek revival, has 13 WPA murals with the history of Staten Island on the interior, mm -hmm. all put in during the uh, w WPA era, during the Depression. Historic Richmond Town, it's, it's, it's a, one of those jewels in New York City that not many people know about. It's a community very similar to Williamsburg in Virginia. Uh, it was established by Lawrence McCullen, a collection of 15 historic buildings from the 17th to the 19th century. It's open to the public and you can visit. It's on 25 acres, well worth the visit. There's the Christopher House. Several movies and TV shows were filmed here and including Broad Walk Empire, the Lake Tyson House, 1740. These are all at Richmond Town. Richmond Town represents the area of Staten Island, which was the original capital. It's well inland. Uh, in those days, you didn't want to be hard up against the harbor. It was too cold, too windy. Third County Courthouse, 1837, Greek Revival. There was a trial, a famous trial of Polly Bodine. Edgar Allan Poe and P.T. Barnum reported, reported on the case. They were both newspaper people at the time. And thank you. That takes us through the through the boroughs of New York. We'd like to also uh, tell you that the uh, a lot of the information came from the landmarks of New York, written by Barbara Lee Spiegel, Diamondston Spiegel. Thank you for joining us today for this week's episode of The Scots in Us, where we took a deep dive into the wonderful project that I'm so proud that the American Scottish Foundation have been developing for the past few years the Scots who built New York, and its latest chapter, The Boroughs. A huge thank you to John Kinnear for all his research and time in developing The Boroughs and all the other parts to the Scots who built New York, and also to the Carnegie Corporation of New York for their support 
in this project. We invite you to become involved and up to date on all that is going on with the Scots who built New York. Visit our website and on the first page you will see a banner, the Scots who built New York. Click on it and it will take you to the page that will give you all updates and news as well as ways for you to become involved. We would value your support. And so until next time. <laughs>